Paul staying with us and for being so punctual and time compliant. So with that, we would be prepared to look into our next subject, which is inter included into our International Health Summit agenda. But before we invite our next speaker, we also would like to express our appreciation to informational partners, particularly Dr. Thinking, for broadcasting of the summit to the American platform Hopping. And also this Dorovi agency as well as education platform Invite. With that, my dear friends, let me also emphasize how important this is to pay attention to the screen in front of you. And there you have two QR codes. The QR code on the left, and please feel free to scan it. That would be taking you to the registration sheet to the Hopin platform. So by scanning this QR code, you will receive an invitation to your email for a quick registration and listing in this platform while on the right this QR code can be uh, scanned live or you can film it and thus you will access another element of our summit which is creation of those pieces of medical art which are not represented here within the boundaries of the conference hall but they are an indispensable element of the continuum of our meeting so please feel free to save this QR code for further references and um, quite possibly there will be other business you have to attend to. So registration in the platform on the left will enable you to watch all of the presentations uh, of our speakers in recorded version. So do join, we'll be happy to welcome everyone here. And with that, we are happy to take it further. And before our panel number one starts, which will be dedicated exclusively to the military medicine, there is also an opening presentation about the war as a complex public health emergency. With that, I have the pleasure of inviting the speaker to the stage. But before, let me remind all of you, dear ladies and gentlemen, that you will have an opportunity to ask your questions and suggest your contributions to a discussion. So please think of your comments, questions, if and when any, and we will will definitely provide for an interactive session to announce them. And with that, we are happy to invite the Dean and Professor of University of Maryland, the Admiral Retired Medical Doctor and Master of Public Health. Please welcome Boris Lushniak. Thank you so much for such warm welcome. And I am an American of Ukrainian origin. Two days ago, I have crossed the border between Poland and Ukraine. Although I was born in the US, but my, my mother tongue is Ukrainian because that's the first language I've spoke. Although I was born in the America, my heart is still in Ukraine. Uh, when crossing the border for the first time, since the start of war. I mean, this stage of the war. Uh, I'm sorry, but um, I have to fight down my emotions, but these were emotions of love and passion and empathy of what you are surviving. And again, I was born um, and brought up in Chicago as patriotic Ukrainians. That's the country who has accepted and accommodated our parents some time ago. But since the days of my childhood, we knew that there is Ukraine on this globe. Although that was back in the Soviet Union times, uh, me uh, being a platoon, uh, in the state of Wisconsin, not far away from Chicago, I would be standing to attention and in official ceremonies during the 
ceremony of raising the flag. And there were two banners, the American flag and the blue and yellow flag, which was not did not exist at that time, supposedly somewhere in Ukraine. So there was a question nagging me, what is this country behind that flag? Because that country did live in our hearts and it did exist here and it did live in your hearts as well. Uh, you might ask me a question, what am I doing here? I am the former Master Surgeon, Surgeon General of the United States. And this was an exceptional opportunity to share, to share part of my life for the benefit of America. But following that, I have um, become a dean, an academic. Now I'm a scientist. I'm an academic functional. I am teaching others how to treat, how to provide care. And with that, joining you, I will continue in English because that would be somewhat easier to myself. Just imagine some de technical definitions. But please remember of me as an American of Ukrainian origin who does understand you and who does support you. I've already explained the fact that although English was my second language, it was my second language in their house, it was forbidden to speak English with my parents to their dying days. Right? They were born in Berezhane. Ternopilska Oblast, Western Ukraine. They left Ukraine during World War II. They spent four years in refugee camps in Germany, waiting for that ticket out, waiting for that opportunity to go. Settled in the United States, raised us to be cognizant Ukrainians. I served my nation in uniform for 27 years. Started as a young officer, ended up as a rear admiral. It was an incredible opportunity to serve America, and here's an incredible opportunity for me to come back and serve Ukraine. My topic today is war as a complex public health emergency. It's a little different than the rest of this conversation we're going to have over the next few days. Or am I talking about surgery? We have the chief surgeon of the Ukrainian military here. We have incredible specialists out here. We are going to talk technical matters. But I want to introduce the public health aspects of this first. We know what happens during war. We know the difficulties, the evil, the trauma that exists out there. But at the same time, my perspective is going to be slightly different, which is how is the population dealing with all this? In medical meetings in the United States, we're obligated to do disclosures. Who am I? And is anybody out there questioning where I'm coming from? I don't have any relevant financial relationships with commercial interests. I am here supported by AMI, Expeditionary Healthcare. They paid my way. I'm telling you that. Although I'm here not as an agent of that company, I am here as the dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland. The university said, go there, see what's happening in Ukraine from a public health ang angle, because we, the University of Maryland, a state-run institution, needs to be involved. My work is supported by the state of Maryland, and formerly it was supported by the US government. I'm going to ask you to do an exercise here right away, and, and this is important. First of all, let's all stand up, if you would. Stand up and stretch. Move your body around. Don't be shy, right? We're going to be spitting a lot of times at, at the meeting, and so therefore, do whatever needs to be done in order to make yourself wake up, to make yourself feel good. Stretch, use that uh, muscle, use those incredible parts of your body that oftentimes during a meeting like this ends up being what? Ends up being just flaccid, just sitting. 
I'm going to ask you to do something. Don't sit down yet, Admiral Scott. I'm going to ask you to turn to your left or to your right or behind you and introduce yourself to somebody that you didn't know before. And whether it's a hug and embrace, whether it's a handshake, Vitaim. Vitaim. Hi, my name is Boris. Hi. Now I'm going to ask you to sit down. I'm going to ask you to sit down and for a second, just be very quiet. For a second, close your eyes and take yourself to a happy place. Think of your loved ones. Think of your family. Think of the best time you've ever had. Concentrate on clearing your mind. Be in a good place. Big deep breath in. Breath out. One more breath. Okay, now we're back. So what we experience right now, and I'm starting out with terminology, is in essence the definition of health. I'm a believer in this definition, the World Health Organization definition. What we experience right now is that state is, uh, is health is what? It's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And not merely the lack or the absence of disease or infirmity. So when I'm talking about health and we talk about health effects, we're not just talking about do I have hypertension? Do I have cardiac issues? Do I have diabetes? The ideal and the aspirational aspects of health is complete. It's aspirational. It means we're all covered. And it means that physically, mentally, and socially, I am well. I am there. Now, when we talk about health, we talk about various things that are affecting that health. And this is a complex slide, but realize that health in that bigger picture, it depends on our social environment, our physical environment. It depends on genetics, right? What is our DNA telling us about? Ultimately, our individual responses. Are we smokers? Are we drinkers? Do we eat well? Part of that is individual approaches, and that affects our health and function, our disease. We throw health care into that. Do I have access? But ultimately, a goal of our lives is what? Well-being and prosperity, the bottom part of this slide. So this is now a complex matter, because it's not that simple. When we talk about public health, a definition I'll throw, my favorite definition, when I speak with my students about this, this is the definition from 1920, over 100 years ago. And it deals with the three Ps. It's about promoting health and well-being. It's about preventing disease and injury with the ultimate goal of prolonging a high quality of life. That's what public health is. And although I'm a physician, a clinical physician trained in family medicine, trained in occupational preventive medicine, trained in dermatology. That's my clinical side. But most of my life, I've been a public health practitioner. I've been this idea of trying to get that population to be better. Another concept to throw out there is the fact that we live in the world where we used to think it was all about human health, right? Colonel, you went to medical school. We learned about the human body. Now in the 21st century, we realize the concept is much more complex because our health is not independent of the health of the world around us. That includes animal health, right? Even when we look at coronavirus, that came from the animal world, right? We know that there was something there that transported itself. We talk about plant health. We talk about environmental health. We talk about the idea of how this interplay 
between us and humans, the animal world, the plant world, the environment. Right? Is climate change a health issue? It is, because it intertwines with all this. So when we talk about health, I've just added a, letter, a layer of complexity, because it's no longer us humans that are in charge. We can't be independent of the other parameters that live on this beautiful planet of ours to be able to progress in health. Our Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion, 1986, gave us a great listing of the fundamental conditions and resources for health. What is necessary for us to have a healthy population? And number one on that list, peace. Mir. Isn't that an interesting approach that we talk about health and it's not the medicines, it's not the surgeries that affect population health. It's having peace. Throw into that the other aspects of who we are as individuals, shelter and education and food and income, a stable ecosystem, sustainable resources, social, social, social justice and equity. All this plays a role in health as well. But it starts with peace. Now, my theme today is talking about war as a complex emergency and how does it affect the population. Definition of a complex public health emergency is that it's a relatively acute situation. It happens quickly. It affects a large civilian population. There's a combination, potentially, of war, of civil strife, food shortages, population displacement, and it results, ultimately, and excessive mortality. It results in death. So complex emergencies are, by de facto, public health crises. The cause of the emergency, as well as the assistance, are bound oftentimes by intense political considerations. So is public health politics? Yeah. Whenever I make decisions, whether I was acting Surgeon General of the United States, serving along my dear friend, Rear Admiral Scott Guyberson, who was the acting Deputy Surgeon General, when we made decisions, we had to take into account the political leaders that were there. We were uniform people. We were career people like you, Colonel. And we were just trying to do our job, but with the politicians occasionally getting away, and I'm not disrespecting the political side of the House. They are necessary to do what they do. Complex emergencies, also characterized by this instability, violence, conflict. Now, when I approach the complex emergency as a public health leader, right, anywhere in the world, it all starts out, and many of the NGOs who are working here, August Mission, others who are present in the room, you realize there's a path forward on this. And from a public health aspect, here are our major considerations. The assessment. We talk about immunizations for populations, water sanitation, food nutrition, shelter, site planning if necessary, health care, public health surveillance, control of communicable diseases in that group, the human resources, the coordination. So right now I'm talking independent of war. I'm talking complex emergencies and our approach what is good for the population? Now, let's get a little bit more into the weeds. And perhaps, I dare say, a little depressed. Because when we talk about war, we realize that it's not just the war fighter in charge. Colonel, you're on the front lines. You said three days ago you were at the front. You're saving lives. You see the warriors coming through. The war fighters doing their work. But in addition, there's a population around those war fighters. And when we look at the numbers, they are mind blowing. They are so disturbing. In the 20th century alone, 191 people died from war, both direct and indirect. <sighs> Unfortunately, we as a society head in the wrong direction, right? We, we've developed these incredible things in public health, in medicine, right? You have surgery capabilities now, Colonel, you've not ever had, and certainly last century we didn't have. We have incredible medicines. We have incredible approaches to public health and to health. We have advanced vaccines, 
medications, procedures. And yet in that advancement, in the 20th century, the people who died from war and conflict were nine times larger than each of the previous four centuries. So unfortunately, in this advancement, we've gotten better at, and I'm going to be bold to say this, we got better at killing each other. Right? That's an advanced society. And the deaths tend to be primarily amongst the civilians rather than the war fighters. 60 to 90 percent of all war related. Between 1990 and 2017, an average of 1 million indirect civilian deaths per year. That compares to 50,000 direct deaths from war. Civilian population. And, and the consequences, as you can see here, not only death, but sickness. Displaces populations, destroys the infrastructure, we heard from the deputy minister today, causes environmental destruction, diverts human and financial resources. How much has already been spent on this war? I'll put it out there, a war of aggression from the Russian side, right? Did we need this at this point? Did Ukraine need this? You're defending yourselves, your freedom, and yet we have to acknowledge that this is an incredible diversion of resources and that this mantles human rights protections. When we talk about the indirect impact, it's infrastructure, farms and food supply system, water treatment supply system, shelter, healthcare facilities, forced displacements of individuals. We talk about malnutrition as a potential, food as a weapon. We talk about the communicable diseases, already an issue in many countries, including Ukraine. Measles, COVID, HIV, tuberculosis, diarrheal diseases, non-communicable diseases. It doesn't mean that our chronic diseases go away during a time of war. Maternal and infant disorders. And of course, something that we oftentimes in the medical world neglect and that's the world of mental and behavioral disorders, right? The human mind is complex, and yet those are part of the issues. And we talk about Ukraine, and the minister talked a little bit about the health effects already. This is October of 2022, over a year ago. And yet we saw through this survey of the effects on, on Ukraine, on Ukrainians. One in three adult Ukrainians sought primary care. One in two responded that there was at least a one barrier to that care. One in five couldn't get the medications they needed. Cost, availability, long queues were part of the problem. Those living in temporarily occupied territories and active combat zones were very affected, as were the internally displaced. 22% were not able to get the medicine they needed. Medication for blood pressure, for heart conditions, pain medication, sedatives, antibiotics. So this is in the time of war when you realize because of those resources, because of those issues, we are now affecting the health of the population in other ways. And it's not just in the war front. It permeates through the whole country. So we talk about health in Ukraine. We heard from the deputy minister today, the healthcare facilities, staff being targeted, hospitals being damaged issues of access to care for the population, the immunization program. We already knew that Ukraine was not doing necessarily very well on vaccinations. We are not doing very well in the United States either on vaccinations. And yet in the time of war, you fall further behind. Medications and medical supplies are training that needs to be taken place. Trauma care, prosthetics and rehabilitation, mental health and environmental health. You know, the issue presented with the explosion at the Kakhova Dam, right? The impact on not the only people, but the environment. And remember that slide that talks about One Health, how that ultimately impacts individuals. I'm not going to go through these slides because the deputy minister had talked a little bit about the impact. WHO surveillance shows that there has been an impact, obviously, on health in Ukraine and the targeting, attacks on health care, attacks on facilities, attacks on medical transport, personnel being affected, patients being affected, warehouses, 
Most attacks were with heavy weapons. Most attacks occurred early on in the war, but continue to this point in time. So when we look at the impact of health, again, it's now permeating throughout all of Ukraine and all of society. An interesting approach from the Ministry of Health early on because the world wanted to help. What do we do? And so in essence, the Ministry of Health came up with the idea of saying, okay, receiving dozens of appeals early on in the war, they've created a priority list. This is an example of what was online. Why did I know about this? Because I was one of the people saying, I have to do something. Where can I provide a need? And I'm showing this that this is no longer an active site as of last week because perhaps it's overwhelmed now in terms of what the needs are. But this shows you right off the day, right off the bat, in the first few weeks and months of the war, how all of a sudden you have issues of baby food, diapers, right? This is the Ministry of Health acknowledging that this isn't for the war fighter. This is the Ministry of Health saying, this is affecting our population, and here's what we know we're beginning to need. I'm going to finish up talking about a concept that's out there now, one of ecocide. Ecological damage that now affects that triangle of human health, animal health, and planetary health. The unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. We use the term genocide. We use the term homicide. We use the term suicide. These are killing in various fashions. Ecocide is killing the environment, but with ultimately direct or indirect impact on human health. So, as I conclude this presentation, what is the answer to all this? In public health, we talk about prevention. We used to have smallpox, ravaged us in the 20th century. And yet, an international effort involving the World Health Organization, involving a partnership between enemies, the Soviet Union and the United States and many other countries work together to fight an infectious disease. Smallpox vaccine programs throughout the world. By 1979, we had the last case of smallpox in Somalia. By 1980, the World Health Organization said, we have eliminated, eliminated an infectious disease off the face of this planet. It exists now in two laboratories, one in Russia and one in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That's where this virus is limited to. Otherwise, we've eliminated it. Can we take the same prevention aspect to war? I tell my students all the time that if you're in public health, you have to be an optimist. There are too many challenges out there that if you're a pessimist, you will not survive a career in public health. And so as an optimist, my sense is we have to learn from these lessons, whether it's Russian aggression against Ukraine, whether it's the war taking place here, whether it's Gaza and Israel, whether it's Syria, whether it's any of the places, I have to begin looking at it from a preventive medicine aspect. Prevention of the indirect effects of war include protecting civilian in infrastructure, reducing forced displacement, protecting healthcare workers and facilities. These are not easy matters, but we need to put in the forefront. These are things you cannot do. And then we bring up the idea of prevention of war as a general thing, as a general concept person I have a much respect for, a professor named Barry Levy, has a book called From Horror to Hope. Last week, we presented together at a meeting in Italy talking about this. And in essence, is we as a society have to be ashamed that we've killed more people in the 20th century than the four previous centuries. That's a shame for us as humanity. We have to strengthen the infrastructure for peace, hold aggressors accountable promote the rule of law, straighten civil society, attempt to reserve, 
resolve disputes nonviolently, reduce the root causes of the war, militarism, socioeconomic inequities, ethnic and religious animosities, poor governance, environmental stress. I'm not saying these things are easy. Many of you may be rolling your eyes saying, where's Boris going? We'll never do this. I have to, I have to have faith that we as a humanity will learn from our mistakes and ultimately get to where we want to be. I'm going to finish with this statement. Right? There's a thing that is worse than evil. What is it? It's indifference to evil. One of the things I didn't list on my biases, and I listed it when I gave a similar talk in Italy last week, is my own bias. I started out talking about my Ukrainianism, my roots, my patriotism for two countries, for the United States and for Ukraine. In my disclosures at the meeting last week, I said, you know, this was the first war that hit me, that hit me inside. Two days after the war began, my, my daughter posted something. She didn't ask me, Tato, you know, will, you, will you allow me to post this? What she posted was a feeling from a 22-year-old young woman, young medical student who was home at the time. And what she posted was, last night was the third time I ever saw my father cry. It was when Baba died, when his mother died. It was when Dido died, and this when this war started. So I got hit hard by this. And I'm not here as a victim. I'm not saying that I was hit any differently than others. But my disclosure at that meeting saying, unfortunately, this is the first time it hit me so close to home. But why didn't I have the same reaction when things were happening elsewhere in the world? Why didn't I have the same reaction to Syria, to Lebanon, to the Middle East, to Afghanistan, to, yes, even the wars that America brought that had the same indirect effects? So my issue here is I'm the first to admit. I ask forgiveness, right, to be able to say that I was indifferent to this until it hit me personally, until all of a sudden I'm involved, until all of a sudden my family in Kiev and my family in Vyv and my family in Berejane are now in harm's way. And now, all of a sudden, it becomes personal. All of a sudden, I notice war. All of a sudden, I realize, oh, this is terrible. People, as a humanity, we have to realize that our indifference plays a role. We are in control of this planet. We have to believe that. We are in control of our governments. We are in control of the world. It may be difficult, but the biggest public health threat is indifference. Thank you very much for your attention. Друзі, власне, як ми і говорили, у нас буде можливість задати запитання пану Борису і спікерам, які будуть сьогодні на першому дні нашого саміту. Тому, в кого виникло, виникло питання і є бажання, можемо підняти руку, щоб ми вас побачили, і обов'язково дати мікрофон для того, аби ми почули пан Борис і всі ті, хто з нами є, зараз дивиться трансляцію на платформі Хопін. Так, ми маємо запитання, будь ласка, ось на туди біля камери, якщо можливо, та наші помічники обов'язково підійдуть і дадуть мікрофончик. Не соромтеся, поближче мікрофончик для того, аби ми чули і всі, хто є зараз з нами. Будь ласка, просимо. Um, uh, hi, uh, Dr. Uh, Lushniak. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, speech here today. Uh, and also, well, Thank you for your service. I know you're your uniform. And let me first acknowledge, I would love everybody who has served or is currently serving in the Zbrojnia Silo Ukraine and the Ukrainian Armed Forces to please stand. Um, thank you. Please stand. I also applaud for the armed forces. <laughs> but please, back to your question. Um, 
I would like to start by thanking you for addressing us in Ukrainian first. This you, you can't even imagine how much it means to well all Ukrainians. And, and I'll tell you right now, I feel terrible because it takes me longer to prepare my talks, and sometimes I lose a little bit of that spontaneity because I never write my talks. I, I someday I will give the whole talk in Ukrainian. I know my Ukrainian colleagues in America who are watching right now saying, "What well, Buddhist, you know, tipuvin and bu prihutovitsi krasche." Ale, thank you. You did amazing. Thank thank you. You. Uh, so my question is uh, about perception of veterans in civilian society. So there's a narrative in Ukraine nowadays that um, it's not the veterans who should reintegrate into civilian society, but the society has to integrate into this new reality of veterans coming back. Uh, but I kind of struggle to understand that narrative, truth be told. Like, um, so I came back from active duty, um, now a TCCC instructor, and I don't do evacuations anymore. I'm a combat medic. Um, but I struggle with, you know, coming back from war. And I don't know what's the right approach in here is. So I think, could, and you know, it, it's almost, you know, now I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one of the things I didn't list on there, and, and it perhaps falls into many different realms. It's not only the physical repercussions of war upon the veterans, but it's the, the, the PTSD, the mental health effects, right? It, it, if I had the answer, I would like to say, well, in the United States, look at what we do. Look at our veterans post-Vietnam in the United States. To this day, we are still suffering the effects of not acknowledging those veterans, first, as heroes coming home, and then secondly, taking care of them. Now, the unique feature certainly in the United States is we have a veterans health care system. Rear Admiral Scott Guyberson, right, who's retired, as I am, from the, the uniformed services, we are veterans. We can go to those hospitals, we can get care, and depending on income levels and all that, that is free care. We can get mental health care. We can do all these things. So one thing I'm, I'm you know, promulgating here in Ukraine is make sure that as the Ministry of Health has multiple, multiple priorities, amongst them you cannot ignore the important fact of introducing a system of care either embedded in the current care system or separate from we were critical of our care system because it's only for veterans there are hospitals where if you were sick and outside of that hospital you cannot go to because you don't have the right veterans card that's how we cherish our veterans and yet we are not necessarily the world example of good care many of our veterans are homeless many of them have substance abuse problems many of you of them have a, a system of integration I applaud you for your work with veterans, but veterans need to be taken into account in this impact system. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Дякуємо. Друзі, є ще маємо питання, будь ласка. А, так, є. Можемо, будь ласка, так за камери трішки зробити пару кроків вперед, не соромитися, так. Угу. Can see you better instead of hiding behind the camera. I'm a uh, advisor for uh, August Mission, also an advisor for Aspici, which is a um, company here in Kyiv that is focused on the problem of PTSD. Um, Boris, thank you for your words. Amazing. Question. Uh, in regards to the indifference from the West, or actually from everyone, what is your view on how we all, all of us, Ukrainians, Americans, everyone here in this room, how can we do a better job of being convincing and being as passionate as you in regards to communicating to our family, our friends, our politicians to move away from indifference, to change that mindset? I'm very curious about your perspective on how you Carry that forward. I think it's there's there's two answers to it. One of which is we be relentless, and I'll use the term as diplomats. Certainly the Americans and the people from Western Europe who are here. Ukrainians have a different Ukrainians living here and fighting this war, your concentration needs to be twofold. One is fight the war. And do peremohe, right? To victory. That's your attitude. You have to keep it up despite everything going on in the world. But also the Ukrainians have to be able to understand several things. One of which is 
do not stop telling us what you need and what we need to be doing. Do not get despondent that uh, they're not listening. Do not get despondent that they're not doing something. Keep it up. Communication needs, wants, desires. There's an element out there that is so critical, right, for you to be able to do this. I received an email. I've been sending my friends dispatches, right, of, of, of this trip. And yesterday I get one from a Captain Bruce Bernard, a dear friend of mine, also retired, who said, tell those incredible people in Ukraine that despite what the House of Representatives and the U.S. government may be doing right now, we are with you and this will, support will continue. That's a single citizen. And getting back to the rest of us in the United States as an example, do not stop talking about this. Do not stop being diplomats. There are times where we get discouraged as well, saying, oh my God, this is, you know, no one's listening. No, you keep talking until people listen. You knock on doors, you talk to your representatives in Congress, you tell them, right now, you have something that very few Americans have. You have seen this. You have felt this in your heart. You have felt this in your spirit. So don't stop. Don't get despaired. Remember what I tell my students. You're now, raise your right hand. You are now a public health person. Look at it anyway. And you are now optimistic about the future. All right, the former acting Surgeon General of the United States can do that. So you felt magic, didn't you? That's you. Okay. But anyhow, that's our key role. It's going to be communicate and then show up. Now, we, we heard at the beginning of this meeting the big difference, right? Scott and I, when we were talking about organizing ourselves at this meeting, two decisions. Oh, you know, it's much easier to sit at home and do this via Zoom. We'll do our presentations via Zoom. Uh, you know, do I want to travel? Oh, my God, 15 hours on a bus from Warsaw, three hours at the border. And yet we made that decision early on saying, no, 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 no. If we're going to do this right, if we're going to say to the colonel, and we're going to say to leadership of academic military medicine that we are with you, we're here. We're here not as tourists. We're here not to show old pictures, look at us. We're here not to make new friends. We're here because it's a sign of support. And if I had met the colonel here, on the Zoom, it would have been two seconds. And yet today, people, I'll tell you, when I looked into the colonel's eyes, I saw my brother. I saw strength. I saw worry. Right? That was 30 seconds of looking into a person's eyes. So stay engaged. Get your friends to come here. Get your neighbors to come here. Let them see for themselves. And then finally, going back to that last slide, we have a lot of evil in the world. Evil that's around us in our own country, evil that's here. Let's really work hard. God help us. Let us work hard to recognize evil and to rally against it. Thank you. Thank you. Master of Ceremonies, you're in charge of the time because I have lost all sense of <laughs> Okay. Друзі, що ми маємо? Ще запитання, будь ласка. Okay, with that, do we have any more hands to raise and questions to ask? Yes, indeed. Please wait for the microphone, making sure you are audible not only to people in attendance, but also online participants. Thank you, and with your permission, I continue in Ukrainian. I'm an anesthesiologist. My name is Alexei, and I work with uh, uh, military medics. Uh, and thank you, uh, dear Boris, for your engagement, for your commitment, for your contribution in supporting Ukraine. And particularly, thank you for taking this pain of 15-hour bus ride 
to get here for the benefit of having this live communication because communication indeed is precious also you mentioned the aftermaths of the vietnam war remembering that it's been decades away from the modern day realities but yet the problems of veterans and the problems that veterans experience, mental health, substance abuse and everything else. That drives me to this question where Ukraine, not even close, has in its possession the resources that the United States had at their disposal following the Vietnam War. But now, decades away, with all of the technology development and research behind it, are there any lessons to share about efficient and inefficient uh, techniques, solutions and tools which can be utilized for the benefit of serving the veterans right? What are the mistakes that we should better omit? Not to waste our time, not to waste our resource, not to waste your support particularly those lessons which you learned from the war in Vietnam, because unfortunately Ukraine does not have time, resource and human resource in particular to waste to learn our new lessons. Thank you for your question. We made plenty of mistakes and tomorrow I believe we will have a better contact with and uh, a session to interact with representatives of the Ministry of Health and we definitely will engage in very close communication and uh, we wish to have a direct contact between the Veterans Affairs Unit and the Ministry of Health and indeed now we have the 21st century century of opportunities remembering the telehealth and telepsychiatric services when you use internet to cover the distances to become closer to the patients and to make our help better accessible and again you might be a counselor who's helping to a group of veterans over the distance but at the same time I can't say that um, I'm a regular American, and to some extent I'm not, but, um, but yet there are many cases when we, the Americans, claim that look at this solution that we invented, we designed, we developed it, and there are some solutions which definitely should be considered, but in many cases even we are not quite certain whether or not we have learned our lesson right. And that's where and why we have to collaborate. Now you have the war in your country, in our country, in our Ukraine. And we are learning together with you about the problem challenges, about the uh, problem solutions, mental issues, physical issues. And now we, you are generating experience that we have to learn from you not relying on the good old style lessons and with that uh Staying here all the way through Thursday, so I will be definitely cruising around. Whenever you have a question, please approach, introduce yourself, and I'll be happy to have a chat with you. Okay, dear Boris, please take a note that you will not be the only one occupying this stage. We have other speakers in our agenda, but definitely we have plenty coffee breaks and networking opportunities over lunchtime breaks and afterwards. And with that, the final opportunity to ask a question is part of this opening session. If not, then there is a question which I wanted to save for later, but having read the article the article following your visit to the ukrainian catholic university in lviv where you spoke with a lecture to the graduates and alumni uh, so having read that article i have a question so before we thank you and continue with our panel one i didn't want to but i have to and the question is as follows to you specifically and that i believe will be the uh, crowning note so dear boris please 
quote what would be the best place on this planet for you. And why is it Berezhane in Ternopil neighborhood? Well, I have to admit that indeed I spoke to a good friend of mine, uh, Roxelana Horboa, who is now in the United States. And we spoke a lot over internet just a couple of hours ago because she's still in the US and she could not make the travel right. So we, our discussion was that we have one foot in the United States and another foot stretching all the way down to Ukraine. So indeed, my roots are from Berezhane. And recently, indeed, I was speaking to the graduates of uh, Ukrainian Catholic University. And today I feel sorry that I cannot wear a uh, Vishivanka, a uh, Ukrainian traditional shirt. Because I do remember that I had my father's Vishivanka, which was embroidered by hand by my mother uh, while she was in concentration camps. And this shirt traveled over the ocean. And the, we wore that shirt in every um, official ceremony, concert, festival. First of festival, 22nd of January, in each and every ceremonial opportunity. And it also traveled to Washington in the Freedom for Ukraine demonstration, sending Russia to hell back in 1960s and 70s. The same Vishivanka has seen the entire US. Now that my father has uh, gone to the better world, I inherited it. And two years ago, this Vashavanka, for the first time ever, came to Ukraine. And f following this lecture at the Catholic University, it arrived to Berezhane. And it was the first time ever when that Vashavanka has opened has entered the doorstep of the house where my father was born. So there is a lot of history behind that Vashivanka. And with that, you will hear the round of applause, which will be strong in a ceremonial event enough for this crowning element in our opening session. And I would like to extend this ceremonial momentum to share this applause with the rest of the speakers of our esteemed panel, but also those people who obviously are not here in the room, but they do deserve uh, their, um, our appreciation, as well as people inside, particularly our facilitator, as well as our technical team with audio and visual support who are working with our slides. It t-shirt, to dvoma and also there is a special team who take care of our reliable communication. So our sincere appreciation to all of those who help us better understand each other. And as we have it a tradition here in Ukraine, every speaker coming to this stage is welcomed by the round of applause. But that round of applause is even louder when the speaker is leaving the stage, advocating for the hours. And with that, my esteemed colleagues, thank you for the feedback. Thank you for.